of you guys watched the funeral today? Some powerful stuff, was it? Powerful stuff. It? Okay, so let me ask this again. How many of you guys watched? <laughs> it was, oh, it was so good. It was so, did, uh, did, did it make you wish that we, that all, that all of our leaders in America today were old people, like from the 80s and 90s, and they still had the capabilities of being our leaders? We, we honestly, I'm sitting there watching this, listening to this, and, I, and, and, I'm, and I'm telling myself, even I have forgotten what kind of integrity that we used to have in leadership in America. What kind of character there used to be. There's always been dumb, bad stuff in politics in America, as far back as you can go, trust me. But I'm just talking character and stuff. It's just Anyway, what does that got to do with tonight? No, I'm asking you, what's that got to do with that? All right. Well, maybe it's cold outside. <laughs> it's not winter yet for another couple of weeks. It's not winter, but um, winter's trying to hit while it's still fall, and I always worry about that. Even though the times that winter has come early, oftentimes it is left early, then we have times like last year where there really wasn't any snow till spring pretty much was here. So it's just weird how the seasons go, isn't it? I, I want to talk about seasons just a little bit. And it, it's, it's really kind of... Uh, got in my spirit last week when I was doing the hump day video and did it on seasons and then it just began to broaden in my spirit and I actually was planning on talking about this last Wednesday night before we had to cancel because of what the seasons um, was doing out there and I want to talk about um, the seasons of God through the filter of this past teaching season that we just finished with the sovereignty of God now, I, look, I know I have some life experience. I know how easy it is to hear sermons and teachings and go to Sunday school class or read a book, watch something on TV, a sermon or something, um, especially a series. A series seems to land more than just a teaching, and it, it stir you, move you, begin to uh, renew your mind, change how you think and stuff, um, and then weeks later to slowly move away from that. We have to be very intentional about that. Um, this, this season that we just finished in here with the sovereignty of God and the free will of men, it is incredibly um, fundamental and foundational to retain that. Um, you, you must keep that as a filter in your life for everything that happens, whether it's something just personally happening to you in your life, your family, um, the nation, uh, the world, whatever it is. You must keep that as a foundational filter in your life and pass everything through. And if you do, it radically changes your worldview, your kingdom view, your God view, your you view. It changes everything. Is it James who warns us about looking in the mirror, seeing ourselves, and then walking away and forgetting what we look like? He's comparing that to things that we have learned teachings and foundational things we've got to be very very intentional to on purpose retain things that God teaches us okay so I want to talk about um, the seasons of God in our life and pass it through the filter of the sovereignty of God now most of you guys are very familiar if nothing else in Ecclesiastes you're familiar with Ecclesiastes 3 1 there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. Under heaven. Okay. There's a time and a season for everything. Now, Ecclesiastes was written by Solomon, of course. He was supposed to be incredibly wise. Um, it's hard to get through Ecclesiastes. If you ever tried to do a devotional on Ecclesiastes, good luck. That's all I can say. Um, hope you don't pick that binge drinking habit back up before you get done. Um, he can be... He, he can be a little, a little depressing sometimes to read, but you've got to pull back and you've got to see the big picture of what he's saying. He's just he's trying to be a realist with life. And uh, he's trying to make people become very, very intentional with how they're living their life. That's the bottom line of Ecclesiastes. He's trying to get you to be very intentional with your time and how you're living your life. 
on being purpose driven. So he says there's a there's a time and a season for for everything. And one of the things that you learn from creation on is that um, everything that God did in the natural would prophesy of how the spiritual realm of God would work. Everything. We've talked about that for 24 years here. Um, if you've read The Architect of Eden, you know that that, that book um, talks about that a lot. Everything in the natural prophesies of the spiritual. Everything that God has made in the natural, he did on purpose, very intentionally to try to help us understand how the unseen realm of God was going to work. With male, with female, with getting married, with having children, um, with cutting covenant together, um, everything, the human body, how the body functions and works together with every little part, um, everything, sowing and reaping and, and the seasons. God didn't have to do anything the way that he did. He did it to, to try to explain to us how life with him would work. And there is no life outside of him. There's a, there's a, a short existence and then it's over. But eternal life with God, it depends on now in this season while we're alive, learning how God thinks, how God works. Why do you think Paul mostly deals with the renewing of the mind? And some of us, grew, most of us that grew up in church, we grew up, grew up very different than that. It's like, you know, say your sinner's prayer and keep the Ten Commandments and just try to hold on until Jesus comes back or you die, whatever comes first. There was, no one was preaching purpose. No one was preaching the kingdom of God at hand. No one was explained to us that we were kings and priests in the earth. Nobody explained to us that our eternity has already started. We're not waiting. I, I, I almost played off of words in a song. I, I think it's a Switchfoot song. Jonathan will know. And I can't remember the song, but I remember one of the great lines in the song. It says something like, stop waiting for the afterlife to live your life. Afterlife. It's called afterlife. <laughs> Makes sense to me. What a powerful concept. Stop waiting on the afterlife to live your life. <laughs> it has already begun. Maybe the body isn't going to be here forever the way it is, but your eternity has already begun. Your purpose begins the day that you give your life to him. He gives his purpose to you. And we've got to be very intentional to, to learn how to think like God. So, everything in the natural is an explanation of how God works. And the seasons are very, very important. Seasons are about change. It's all they're about. Seasons are about change. In the natural, seasons are about change. This is the time of year that, that everything goes dormant. And the leaves fall off because there's no more sap coming up. There's just enough sap to keep the tree from dying, but most of it goes down into the roots. Um, and that's why you have to be very careful what time of year that you dig trees, especially certain kinds of trees, because it depends on how much sap is in the roots versus up into the tree and into the limbs and so forth. And, uh, and so even, even evergreen trees right now, that they, they go into a partial dormancy. That's why they tend to shed needles real bad in the winter going into the spring because there's a partial dormancy that even evergreens go into. I know that if you're way down south, there are many things that, that do never, they just don't go dormant. But we don't live there. We live where there are four seasons. This is called Four Seasons Country. So seasons are about change. It's about things dying. It's about things birthing. It's about things growing. It's about change. And so um, seasons are about the cycles of life, right? And we even see that in the big picture of seasons. Um, the biggest thing that seasons depends on is the sun, right? Where, where are we at in proximity to the sun as we cycle around the sun, as the earth cycles around the sun? You know, where are we at? And, and uh, it's a long way away from the sun, no matter even when, when we're close to the sun, but it changes the seasons, doesn't it? And it, it, it affects things. It, the cycles affects the change in the earth. The human body, it's the same way. We go through cycles. We go through change. Um, I want to get all personal and stuff about, about lady stuff, but we, we understand 
um, cycles with women. And if women don't have those cycles, guess what they can't do? They can't birth something new. Um, everything is a story, a picture, a symbol, an explanation from God how life works. Seasons are important. No seasons, no change because there's no growth. And everybody wants to grow, I guess. Most people, I would like to believe, want to grow, spiritually speaking. Um, but I don't know how many people like the seasons that produce the change. Everything that God's trying to do in us only happens through seasons. Developing a faith. We go through seasons where faith is developed. Relationship with God. How many of you guys can look back at your life now and you clearly see seasons in your life that, um, that you grew closer to God than what you just normally would most times in life? Something happened. Something induced it. You usually knew what it was. Sometimes you didn't know what it was. Um, but in that season, you just remember, you got really close to God in that season. That was a season ordained by the Holy Spirit for that very purpose. Think of the seasons where your faith... Yeah, doesn't that sound beautiful? I love young kids' voices. They told me that two weeks ago. I'm sorry if that disturbed you guys. It's like I didn't even notice it two weeks ago, but I, I'm noticing it tonight. It's beautiful. Uh, faith never grows without going into seasons of change. Your perspectives on life. I was thinking watching that funeral today as, as it kept showing the front row with all the remaining presidents and how diverse they are in nature and character and personality and values and their perspectives on America. Um, very different from each other in so many ways. Their perspectives. Well, bottom line for sure is your perspectives have to mature and change through life. It doesn't just, it doesn't just every day change equally. Um, it's seasonal. You go through things that forces your perspectives to change. Things that happen that, that, that you have to wrestle with. Your worldview. Surely your worldview isn't now what it was 10 years ago or 20 years ago, 5 years ago. I hope that your, your worldview is changing because your kingdom view is changing. This, this season we just finished in here on the sovereignty of God. Should, not, should that not radically change your worldview on every little thing that happens in life? Suddenly, your perspective and your worldview changes. Everything is contingent on seeing the seasons of God in your life and embracing the seasons of God. You've got to be able to see it. That's my whole point tonight that, that I'm wanting to get to. Uh, I'm going to show you uh, the very six most common seasons of God that he intentionally takes us through. And so change and growth is going to de depend on you seeing those seasons for what they are and then embracing those seasons. Not running from them. Not exhausting yourself rebuking the devil. Um, not exhausting yourself putting yourself on 25 prayer chains begging God to make it go away. It depends on that's the difference guys this is Wednesday night class on the rock. This is steak night. We don't have to beat around the bush in here. I'm just going to tell you it's the difference between a mature Christian and an immature Christian. Immature Christians want God to make everything go away because that's the way children are. They run to mommy and daddy, fix it, just make it go away. The mature Christian does not ask for God to take everything away. The mature Christian learns how to embrace, face their giants, face their Philistines, face their mountains. They learn how to overcome. Instead of running from it, they overcome it. They learn how to be victorious. More than conquerors. Um, it's the difference in how we have seen and embraced the seasons in our life. Sometimes seasons are about you. Sometimes the seasons are bigger than you. They're about ministry things that God's trying to pull you into. It's not about you at all. I know that in America... We're very gifted at making our ministries all about us. We've turned ministry into a very glamorous thing in America. Our fancy cars, our fancy houses, and our fancy lifestyles, and our fancy titles, and, 
And uh, some of y'all didn't come from that church world like uh, some of us did, where you, you didn't even have to carry your own Bible into the sanctuary. Someone carried your Bible for you or your briefcase back in the That's how old I am. Back in the days, we carried briefcases. Um, and you got to sit on the big chair. You didn't have to come in at the start of service. You didn't have to come until till the worship service was almost over. And then you got to go sit on the big chair for everyone to look at you um, while you thought, boy, I bet they wish they were me. I can hear that song now that was going through their head. Y'all know what song I'm talking about, right? If I, you want to be me too, I want to be me too. I always felt sorry for them. It's like, do you know what you just missed in here? Some seasons are about you and God's things God's trying to do in you, changing you. Other seasons are about God using you, and it's not even directly about you, but he is wanting to use you. It's about somebody else. What a concept. Now, we love that concept when we're the one that's receiving whatever it is we're receiving from God. We love it that people would see that their purpose would be about ministering to us. We forget that we have seasons where God calls on us, sends us, the sick ones, the apostles to go and, and, and minister um, to specific people, a specific person. Sometimes there is a season where God will assign a person to you, and that's what your season is all about. All right. Here are the six common seasons that the Bible talks about, and there's never a place where you can look it up and the scripture says there are six seasons that God takes us through, and here they are, A, B, C. You, know, you just look through the Bible and, and you see the redundancy, and you begin to see the writing on the wall. Um, you see God clearly has, met, has, has assigned seasons for our life, and then you begin to see what those seasons are in the people in the Bible multiple people going through the same seasons. You see those seasons always had a beginning. They always had an end, ending. It wasn't their whole life. And their seasons would change. And in no particular order. But probably starting with the one that might be the easiest to guess, it would be what's called a season of testing. <laughs> or a season of temptation. Now we know God said, the Bible says that God tempts no man. Well, we understand that. It doesn't mean that there's not seasons assigned by God for temptation. How many's ever heard of the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness? God was not tempting him. The devil was tempting him. Do you remember who orchestrated it, though? The devil did not orchestrate the temptation. The Bible was incredibly clear that it was completely designed by the Spirit of God. He set the whole thing up. And the devil just had to be a willing participant in it. Do what he does best. He tempts and talks. Um, Joe, the same scenario. It's funny, we only have, and I've told you this before, we only have really two, two thorough stories in the Bible. Really three kind of counting in the garden, but we don't get a lot of information in the garden. We're, we're mostly ignorant about what's going on in the garden. Um, but we have Job and the temptation of Jesus. The only two stories that are like complete stories about how things work with us and the devil. Others are just one-liners here and there. These are the only two stories. And the, and the thing they both have in common is that the devil is not in control of what's going on. He's tempting. He's taunting. He's doing what he does. But he's a dog on a leash. He's not the one that's designing the, the plan. He's not the one that's in charge of the plan. God is in charge in both scenarios, and it seems to be God's idea of what's going on in both scenarios. Seasons of testing, seasons of temptation, seasons that the Spirit of God, we are called Christians, right? Which means what? Like Christ, okay. In the old days, we thought that meant we had to be perfect, just like Jesus. In the bigger picture, what it means, how this thing worked with Jesus is how it works with us. We're just like Christ. So we understand. He's called the second Adam. We have, we have the first Adam, we have the second Adam. The second Adam came to show us how the first Adam was supposed to do it, and he failed. 
So Jesus came. He was called the second Adam. Not just God in flesh, but also man in flesh to show us this was God's original design, how man could be, how he could live. Um, and what we have from both Adams is a very clear example of how it works. Um, they have seasons of temptation, seasons of testing, seasons of tests are very important because um, if you pass the test, they are followed by promotions. It's very important. Jesus lived on this planet 30 years, didn't do the first miracle, didn't do the first impressive thing that was ever recorded. He goes into the wilderness. He's, first, he's filled with the Spirit. This is like Christ. This is how we do it. First, you're filled with the Spirit. You go into a season of testing, of temptation. You pass your tests. You overcome. It won't be your last test. But in that case, it was his first. He comes out of the wilderness. He's passed his test. He is promoted. And suddenly, he's doing signs and wonders and incredible things. That's why when his mama said, you're going to do this. He's like, I don't know if it's my time or not, turning the water into wine. She's like, it is time. Somehow she knew it, it is time. That had to be by the unction of the Holy Spirit. She says, no, it is time. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. He had overcome. He'd made it through his, his, his testing season. And he was promoted with great power, great authority. It's exactly how it works with you and I. Exactly. Guys, all I can do is keep apologizing for the things the 20th century church did to us. Our microwave altar experiences. We invented that. We came up with that, not God. In the Bible, altars were for consuming flesh. So I'm all for altars. Let's just be ready to burn some flesh when we come up there. But in the 20th century American church, we turned everything into a, an altar call. What do you need today? Come to the altar. God's going to give it to you. We're going to lay hands on you. God's going to give it to you. I got news for you. The only thing that was instant in the Bible was, was physical healings. <coughs> Faith was not given at an altar call. Character was not given at an altar call. Relationship with God was not given an altar call. Peace and joy was not given an altar call. These were things that people had to go through and endure, get into the wine press, had to get on the potter's wheel, had to be carved on, had to go through seasons of, of testing, having their faith developed and their walk with God developed. It's important for us to see those seasons because if we see those seasons and we embrace those seasons, those are the seasons where our faith is developed. <coughs> faith is never ever, ever, ever developed unless you're going through crap. Anyone want to share a testimony that was different for you so we can feel like there's something wrong with us? Man, when I was fighting that, the shingles in my eye last year and thought I was going to go blind, it was an incredible time of testing for me. My life has been... I mean, you may not see it. You may not know because you're not with me all the time. My wife will tell you, it changed me. It carved on me. I have, I have a more Jesus character right now than I did before that happened. I've never been more compassionate than since that happened. I've never been more patient with people since that happened. Um, I've trusted God to, to in, in some little areas that that before I'm not sure how I would have handled those things, it's, it changed me. It was a season of testing because the first thing you want to think, based on how some of us have been taught, you know, give your life to Jesus, everything will be fine, everything will be great. It's cotton candy from the altar call on the rest of your life. And uh, sometimes it's easy then for that to, to stay stuck in your in the back of your mind, it's like everything should be going good because I'm giving my life away for God. You feel like the disciples, well, Lord, what about us? We've left everything to follow you. 
I mean, I left a very promising, successful rock and roll career. <laughs> Someday I'm going to say that without laughing. And then someone's going to actually take me seriously. Oh, man, I need to go home and Google him. There must be some stuff I don't know. Don't Google me, please. You will find out stuff you don't want to know. Uh, man, I look back at my life, and I know that some of you are even sitting there thinking about your life right now. Some of the hard seasons you went through. You don't always share your scenes with us because you're not the one up here running your mouth all the time. But you hear about our seasons all the time. Man, when we were having miscarriages and how God used those dark days to develop stuff in us that I don't know if it would have ever been developed. The faith that God developed in us when we were going through the endless um, process of trying to get to China to get Hannah. I mean, the, the, the faith building times of, of construction where several of us almost became alcoholics again. Just thought about it. Didn't do it. Just thought about it. If you're visiting, you need to get to know me so you can understand how I talk tongue-in-cheek a lot. Injuries that I've sustained that Meg knows all about. <laughs> um, running injuries. Right now I'm injury free. Today's the first day I ran that that my IT band wasn't hurting afterwards, man. It was a miracle. And I'd like to think that that's the way it's going to be the rest of my life. But I know if you run, you're going to have injuries. And there's been times, I, a couple years ago, I put all my running shoes in a tote. My wife was in the, in the basement working. I was wanting to make a point. I was sulking. I was being a big baby. And I put all my 12 pair running shoes in a, in a big tote. I went downstairs where she was working and I dropped them right in front of her and I said, here, put these in storage. I won't be needing them anymore. Like if I didn't need them anymore, why didn't I just take them to the trash bin at the end of the day? You know how children can be. Well, I just wanted someone to feel sorry for me. That was all. If your wife's not going to feel sorry for you, then who's left? Because your kids sure are not going to feel sorry for you. We've got to see those seasons when they're going on in our life. Tough stuff's going on. Those days you get up and you go, what else can go wrong? Hold on, baby, because I promise you, it's right around the corner, isn't it? Things always happen in threes or fours or fives. If it's just one, it's probably not God. It's just a coincidence that something bad happened. Get ready. I mean, how many, how many ways did the devil tempt Jesus? Four ways. Comes in fours, I'm telling you. Um, but what if, what if we saw those seasons for what they were? What if we just paused and we said, you know what? Father, I'm just going to be honest with you because this is how you're supposed to talk to God. This is how you really pray. Um, hey, Father, I'm not happy with all this stuff going on. I'm just going to tell you I hate it. I don't like it. Um, it's, it's a distraction to things that I want to be focused on right now. But Lord, I recognize that you're in the middle of this. You've designed this season. I know this is an opportunity for me in my weakness being made strong. Help me to see what I need to see right now. Learn to pray that way because the Lord will honor that. I promise you. Because he's already said I'm going to be strong when you're weak. I'm going to open the eyes of your understanding. He just wants, I've told you, your prayer life is how you come into agreement with God. It's how we align ourselves with the will of God. And your, your journey through the wilderness, as we have said, can be 40 days or 40 years. You know the history in that little trek with Moses in Israel, getting from Egypt into Canaan, the land of promise. That was a 40-day trip at most, taking their time. It took them 40 years. You've got to see your wilderness for what it is. The wilderness is something that the Bible teaches us does not go away. You don't go around it. There's no shortcuts. You go through your wilderness, and if you will embrace it, if you'll see it and embrace it, you might be surprised how quick that season passes, how quickly that your faith develops, how quickly God begins to carve on you and change some things with you. Some seasons of testing and temptation are 
for kind of like in Ephesians 6 that we've we preached that, that one verse so many times, talking about the armor of God. It says, when you've, now, when you've done all that you know to do, just stand. Some seasons are, are just about everything in the world coming against you. It, it's, it's probably no different, even though much smaller in scale than Job, where the Lord drops the shrubbery, the hedge, and says, go ahead. I, I, I've designed this season for them. And all this stuff comes against you. And the whole point of the testing is just to see if you'll just stand. Just stand. Because if you just stand, it'll pass. I promise you, it'll pass. It will go away. A lot of seasons for us now are just about seeing if we'll just stand. Will we fall apart? Will we whine? Will we cry? Will we grumble? Will we complain? Will we get mad at God? Will we stop coming to church? Will we start taking it out on everybody else? Will we blame shift? Or will we just stand? And if we just stand, I promise you, there's a great promotion right on the other side of it. I'll end that longest season, um, at least in me talking about it, because it's probably the most common by just reminding you of Joseph that we talked about when we were talking about sovereignty. The dude just keeps standing. You know, he's betrayed by his own family. He's thrown in a pit. All these things describe how we feel sometimes in life. He's thrown to a pit. Um, he's sold into slavery. He's falsely accused. Um, he, he just stood. He just stood through it all. And at the end, he was promoted to the highest place and I want you to think about this. He was promoted to the highest position he could possibly be promoted to in Egypt without becoming the Pharaoh himself. Guess what God's design for your life is? That you be, that you be promoted to the highest position in planet Earth shy of being God yourself. You're seated with Christ Jesus in heavenly places. Where's he at? At the right hand of God. It's all symbolic. Recognize your season of testing or temptation. Embrace it. Get through it. Get your promotion. Get your new level of faith, your new level of authority, your new level of power. The second uh, very common season in the, in the Bible would be called the season of rest, or what would have been known as a Sabbath by some. I want to read Matthew 11 to you here. It's not an explanation on that season. It's an explanation why Jesus came. In Matthew 11, uh, 28, Jesus says, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. Learning from him is a seasonal thing. It's not, it's not an altar call experience. It's a season. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, God wants us to walk. The writer of Hebrews is clear. The Sabbath now represents the grace covenant. We are to walk in a Sabbath every single day of our life now. But it goes without saying there are specific seasons in our life that God has designed for us to learn how to find rest. How many of you guys can relate to seasons where you are not at rest? Your father thinks it is very important for you to learn how to be at rest. Because if you can't be at rest, how can you enjoy life? How can you walk with him? How can you hear his voice? How can you focus on purpose and having faith and ministry and stuff like that? You can't. If you're not at rest, you're going to be so inwardly focused on yourself. You're not going to be of use to anybody. There are seasons. People come here all the time from other places. And... Uh, so a lot of people, the majority that come here, are, are probably more the unchurched type. Thank God he also sends us balance in the house and brings us people that have come from other places that have been very active in churches, working, already know mostly what their gifts and their talents are, what they can bring to the table. But sometimes they come in drained, <coughs> weary, spent. And I always tell them all the same thing. This is going to be your season of rest. Learn how to rest, because I promise you we're going to put you to work. You need us, and we need you. 
You need what we can bring to your life. We need what you can bring to our life here too. But you need a season of rest. Just recover, recoup, um, gather yourself, get a fresh head of steam. The rest is spiritual rest. It's emotional rest. It's mental rest. Sometimes it's relational rest in your family. Um, some seasons are designed by God for that. Um, it's, I, I see the season of, of rest as primary priesthood training. The priest, um, that was, what was significant about the priestly garments was the linen undergarment. Linen was a fabric that did not um, cause body heat. Um, people did not sweat much if they, if they wore linen. The whole point of the priest being ordered by God to wear linen undergarments was because he wanted us to understand prophetically, spiritually, as priests, this is not supposed to be that kind of labor. You're not supposed to labor at serving me. You're not supposed to labor at working for me. This is supposed to be a joy. This is supposed to be the best part of your life. Um, this is in my strength, not in your strength. And so it's good priesthood training to go through those seasons that are all about rest. A third season that I believe the Bible talks about a lot is seasons of sowing or serving. Seasons that stand out a little more than other seasons. We're always supposed to sow. We're always supposed to serve. But if you've, if you've walked with God and you've, you've been active in church life for a bunch of years, you've probably noticed that there are seasons in your life that you've sown more than others, that you've served more than others. That just It's just like God just called for those seasons where you were just in the saddle every time you turned around. You were wearing 20 different hats, and you were actually okay with it. You felt like God wanted you to do that. Or seasons where... Where that for whatever reason, maybe financially, you felt like you were supposed to sow. Well, as my wife and I have went through multiple seasons like that through the years. Um, and it's never been that old ploy to try to twist the arm of God because we were in need. So we we're going to give a little bit more, hoping God would give us a little more back. Uh, don't fall into those fleshly traps. But there have been seasons where we just felt the unction of the Holy Spirit. We were supposed to start giving more. Sometimes it was in tithes and sometimes... It was because there were some situations, some people, some families um, that we just felt like God really wanted us to focus on financially on some things for a while. We've done that. We did that one. There was a year in our life uh, with some situations in the Philippines, actually. Um, the, there were some young pastors over there. They were not getting paid well. I'd been over there uh, multiple times, seeing what some of the issues, some of their battles were. They were trying. They were. Um, they were kicking out babies left and right. They all had multiple children. Um, they were not living in, in good situations. They were not always eating the best. They were sacrificing to be able to be pastors. And these, most of them were so young. And there was, a, there was a year, my wife and I just felt like, this is our purpose this year. We are, we are to sow ourselves into these young pastors and make their life more bearable maybe even pleasant at times, so they can focus on doing the work of ministry in their churches. And it was a season, and then the season left, and we said, well, they're on their own now. We're out of here. God pulled us into something else. Seasons of sowing. Second Timothy 4.2. I wonder what that says. I really do wonder what that says. I write these things down, and I don't remember. Oh, yeah. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. He's saying we need to be ready to minister in season and out of season. We know that. Everyone's familiar with that verse. point I want to make to you is he is saying there are times that it is clearly in season, that that's the design for your life. You're always supposed to be ready to minister 24-7, but he's making clear that there are times that it is truly in season where you are to recognize this is a season in your life that you're really supposed to be pouring your life out as a drink offering, maybe even more than usual. And I, and I tell people they're, they're, you know, the rule of thumb in church is that 80% of the work is done by 20% of the people. We're very different at Cornerstone. At Cornerstone, 75% of the work is done by 25% of the people. We're, we've, we've defied all the odds. <laughs> Now, we're much better at that at Cornerstone Family Church. There's no doubt about it. This is a, this is a servant church for sure. Um, but there's always a handful of people that 
carry a whole lot more weight than anybody else, and they're not getting paid to do it. They wear multiple hats. But there's sometimes that people step into that just as a season, and I hope that they see it, and sometimes I'll even sense it. And I'll tell them, it's like, you know what? Um, we've got this need. I feel like it, that you, you know, I feel like God's really equipped you to meet this need. I know you're already doing these three, three things over here, but I just can't get you off my heart. And I'll always tell them, it's like, I, I just think it's for a season. It's not forever. It's for a season. Well, what can happen that season? Well, you might be training up your replacement, right? Or you might be buying time for someone else to come in that's not even here yet that might even be better at it than you. It's a season. And we need to recognize those seasons and embrace those seasons and not run from them. A fourth season is very similar to that. It's a season of reaping. Uh, Galatians 6 talks about sowing and reaping. And, and it's in verse 9. It, um, it talks about, you know, don't give up. Don't get discouraged in your sowing and doing good because at the proper time it will come back. You, you know, Pastor John Thomas says, don't get discouraged. Don't give up doing the right thing because he says at the proper time you will reap the proper time. What's he talking about? He's talking about a season. There is a season hanging out there somewhere that you're going to be introduced into where all of this sowing you've been doing, sowing your life away, your resources, your energy, your time, whatever it's been. Paul is saying there is a season looming out there that's going to be a season of reaping for you. Well, that's important to God. And I don't know how much we think about it. It's why I'm always pressing the father concept of God. We've got to get this understanding of God as a father so that we'll understand what's important to him for us as his children. He wants us to have seasons where, where he wants us to always be encouraged, of course. But he has seasons for our life where he wants to reward us for giving our lives away, for sowing, for making our life about something bigger than ourselves. God will reward us. There are seasons out there. We've noticed those seasons in our life too. We've noticed seasons where it's almost like we had the Midas touch. I mean, gold would be falling out of heaven. It's just, it's like everywhere we went, it, it, was, it was true. What the Bible said that when Paul said that give it will be given to you, pressed down, shaken together, running over, men will bring it back to you. God uses men and women to bring it back to you. And we've seen those seasons, seasons of reaping, where it's like every time we turned around, something good was happening to us. We would be blessed. Um, I, I know there are a bunch of people here that works at the hospital. We were just talking about that coming down, and, and not because anything, any bad news we've heard or anything. We just we got to talking about the coal mines and how it affected this area, and, and uh, we were talking about. Um, the hospital and just the big employers around here. And we're talking about if anything ever happened to the hospital, how this area would be, Princeton would be affected much more than, than the coal mines shutting down. And it, it's, it's a huge employer for around here. This, this church, you know, it's, a, it, it's, it's a, a lot of people that go here work at that hospital. Um, but they have had seasons that were a little gloomy up there. Um, seasons where people's hours got cut, people got laid off. Um, there were seasons, uh, I know Meg can probably remember a lot of seasons where it's like, what's going to happen here? You know, every time they had uh, one of those doubtful seasons at the hospital, my wife would get a promotion or a raise. It was just, it would just have to be seasons where God wanted to take us in those seasons because, because he, he wants to encourage us. He wants to bless us. How many of you guys know that the Father wants to bless His children. How many mommies and daddies have we got here? Okay. And we'll keep driving this home. If you're a mommy and daddy, if you don't get God, nobody's going to get God. We have to get God. We're mommies and daddies. We know how this works. Mommies and daddies want to bless their children. Children never have to ask for it. It's just our nature. And there are some seasons that we bless our children more than other seasons for whatever reason. God is the same way. Actually, I don't know why I said six. Because I just got five seasons. Just talk to me. We all go through seasons. And I, I can remember a season back in uh, uh, 2003 when I lost my job. The place I worked at closed down. And I went out of business. And Braylon was about a year old at the time. And 
Isn't it funny how you, if you can learn to trust God with those seasons, no matter how bleak they may have looked on the front end, you look back with such fond memories? Yep. Well, this fifth season that the Bible clearly talks about may not be the season you all want to talk about. It's a season of chastening. And none of us are going to be exempt from it. Chastening, not a word we really use that much anymore. Hebrews 12, verse 5 and 6 says, And you have forgotten that that word of encouragement addresses you as sons. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. Do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines those he loves, and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. And this is what we call a season of uh, a chastening. Uh, it's where God corrects us, reproofs us, rebukes us, disciplines us. Um, there's something in our nature that's, that's grating against the nature of God is. Christ and Antichrist are opposing one another inside of us. We're, we're, how many of you guys are real enough and honest enough to admit that you have blind spots? None of us won't admit that. Uh, we all have blind spots. And that's why we always think that it's everyone just falsely accusing us or everyone is, there's a conspiracy against us or everyone's just being mean. They just really don't know us. They don't understand us. I told you, man, by the time a 10th person comes to you and says there's a booger hanging out of your nose, you better go grab Kleenex. <laughs> it ain't a conspiracy. There's seasons that, that it's just a reality. We're, we're human beings. We love God. We're his children. Um, we have eternal life. It's all good. We're righteous. His grace is awesome. And the reality is in the midst of that, we're all really messed up. We got a lot of flesh that we're dealing with. And because of God's love and grace for us, he doesn't throw us away. But the writer of Hebrews wants us to understand. But because he loves us, he disciplines us. Again, how many mommies and daddies we have? Maybe I shouldn't ask this question in the 21st century. I know it's a, it's, a new, it's a new world now. And I know that we don't discipline our children much anymore the way we used to. I think most families here do from what, from what I hear. Um, Hannah said something about the day I went to, she rolled her eyes at me. And I said, one of these days I'm going to smack those eyeballs right out of your skull. And she said, of course, I guess, jokingly, maybe she was serious. She said, I'll call CPS. I said, well, I'm going to call PPS because parents need some protection. <laughs> By the way, my daughter and I have that kind of relationship. We, we beat up on each other a lot, but we're usually laughing about it. I probably ended up with more bruises than she has. I don't really beat my child. And tell me the truth is this is being recorded, isn't it? <laughs> I can't deny it. <laughs> It was the leaf blower. It wasn't. <laughs> so if God is going to, if we've got a blind spot in our character, our nature, we're having anger issues, we just got, we just got some things about us that's not good. It's not, it's not very Jesus-like. In fact, it might even be repulsive to people. It turns people off. It might really be a stumbling block to God even using us. Or it may just be something in us that, that just. A bitter root in us, and we're not even allowing it to really get out that much, but it's just, it's eating away at us. There, if, if God is going to chasten us, correct us, rebuke us, um, reproof us, discipline us, again, it's not going to happen in a Sunday morning altar call. You might be made aware of it in that service. We may give an altar call 
asking for those who agree for God to loose this new season in their life. And if you've been around here for a while, you know that's kind of what we do. Say, if you're in agreement with what God wants to begin to do in your life based on what we've talked about today, come up here and be with me. I've never led you to believe that we're going to wave a magic wand. God doesn't carve character around an altar. But an altar is a good place to open the door, agree with God and say, I'm here to begin to burn my flesh and say, go for it. Your will be done. It's season. I've used examples about my life tonight. This is one area I won't use personal examples because they're too embarrassing. Areas that just, I mean, our biggest issue from the beginning has always been pride. Probably 90% of the seasons of correcting that God takes us into is always going to be related to pride. And pride manifests itself in ways that a lot of times we don't recognize till we get still with God and he has a chance to explain to us why something is prideful in our life. And I know all about those seasons. <laughs> I've also learned to see those seasons for what they are. I've learned to embrace them. And I can tell you, at my age now, those seasons in my life don't last near as long as they used to when I was in denial and pointing fingers and just thought everybody was against me. Guys, there's not a single season that I've listed here that has not showed up in your life and will not continue to show up in your life. There are going to be seasons of testing in your life, in your future. There's going to be seasons of, of rest where God wants to learn, teach you how to, yeah, he wants to learn you how to, how, how to just rest and, and just rest in him. There's going to be seasons in your future that's going to be about sowing and giving your life away. Seasons of reaping where God just wants to bless your socks off and encourage you. And there's going to be seasons that are about discipline because he loves you just that much. Discipline you, carving stuff out of you. Seasons on the wine, in the wine press, seasons you know, on the potter's wheel, seasons of carving, and just seasons of the, of the furnace. If you see the season and you agree with the season and you submit to the season, it's gonna be amazing what God's gonna do in your life. If you see the season and you recognize it and you fail to agree with it and submit to it, you are then officially trapped in a little thing the Bible calls rebellion. That's an ugly word, isn't it? Rebellion. Rebellion is one of the most commonly talked about humanity that is in eight. Paul talks about in Romans, Romans 8. He talks about um, the war that's going on all of us between our flesh and our spirit. And how our flesh does not agree to the things of God. It will not submit to the things of God. But the spirit does agree. It does submit to the things of God. Well, we've got to see that with the seasons. That when we see it. See, the problem is if you come to a church like this and and you're exposed to teachings like we do here, um, now you're accountable. You're accountable to see the seasons, to recognize them, um, to decide if you're going to agree with it, decide if you're going to submit to it. If you do, it's going to be a beautiful thing on the other side of the desert. Um, wasn't that the whole point of, of Moses and Israel? I'm going to set you free. It speaks of getting saved, giving your life to Jesus. And now there's a season that's going to follow. It's going to build your faith. And it's going to do all kinds of wonderful things. But if you get to the season, Cana is on the other side of it. Cana, a land flowing with milk and honey. Still lots of giants there and lots of enemies there. But filled with seasons of prosperity. Filled with seasons of blessing, reaping. So if we see these seasons and we seize them, God's going to do incredible things in our life. If we see them and, and we, just, we just don't like it and we do what Paul said and we allow our flesh to disagree with God, 
then we're to be in rebellion. And now we've lost ourselves into a brand new world that's cold and dark. And you're going to feel like God's presence is a million miles away from you. And it could take you down many dark roads that will not be the truth of what's actually happened in your life. Um, they, it'll be, you know, the illusions of life, right? Um, the pictures we can paint for ourselves. So see the seasons. That's not who she was anymore. Right, that's what she said. She said, that's not who I am. And she said, if they pull out one, they're going to have a whole different view of me in my life. And that's good. That's so good. Oh, that's good. That's, I mean, talking about that, that's just like, you know, even when you were in, in school and you haven't seen people for a long time and you, you run into them, they still want to look at you as that's who you yeah. are. It's one of the reasons why that a prophet isn't welcome in their own hometown because people knew them back when. And I was told under the guise of people prophesying to me that I'd lost my mind when we talked about planting Cornerstone Family Church here. Because I left and I came back that I had a lot of old history and the history I had here wasn't the good kind of history. You know, it was I can't even tell you stuff I did that people knew about. <laughs> it, was, it was some pretty embarrassing stuff, to tell you the truth. Here I was thinking, well, this would be a great testimony. Look what God has done through this guy. That's not always how people see it because they keep seeing you the way you were. But the seasons of life change you. So I was thinking about that today, watching that funeral. I told my wife when I picked her up, um, Meacham, the um, presidential historian. I don't know if you guys watched it or not. He was one of them eulogizing you know, the president today. Oh my goodness, I told her, I found the man that I want to eulogize me when I die because this dude could make you sound really, really good. <laughs> but as I listen to all these people that, and I, and I do realize that nobody's perfect, um, but when we die, you do just hear the best parts usually. That's when suddenly people, their value system is finally in order where they realize what's important and they forget about these trivial things that wasn't that big a deal. But, but as I was listening to them talk about President Bush, you, know, you just realize no matter what your opinion was of his politics or anything else, character-wise, this dude was a class act, man. This dude was the real deal as a father, as a husband, um, as, a, as, a, as a leader in our nation. Um, and then you hear about the stories of his life. And I, I love the I love the old senator from Wyoming that got up to that dude was a hoot, man. And just the people telling the stories about about um, you know when he was in the service and he was shot down and he miraculously survived all that. And he was confused about, you know, why me? You know, why why did God keep me alive? Of course, at the end of the story you look back and it becomes very clear. But what I was hearing was Everything that had happened from when he was that very young man going to the military to the day that he died. And this was a man that stayed very active in life. 
as you well know. You know jumping out of a plane in his 80s and in his speed boat racing around even in his 90s. And um, this dude had been through some stuff. And even politically, he went through some things that, that was not easy. Um, but he was a part of some of the most important world historical moments of our lifetime. When he took his licks, he went through seasons, and I thought, man, I know the man wasn't perfect, but what people could say about my life, what they're saying about him, that you mattered that much, it's just the seasons. It's the difference between ending our life in this realm with God and everyone else looking back saying, wow, that person's life, did it ever matter? Or us ending our life and people not even really noticed and it didn't really change anything that we were going. It really does come down to how you embrace your seasons as you keep changing and growing. It really does come down to just embracing your seasons in life. That's all I got to say about that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.